All right, we're recording now for today. Uh, this Friday, we're going to wrap up our material on uh, the hydrogen atom and spin and then begin our discussion of the variational principle. I wanna draw your attention to homework nine, question number two. I apologize, the wording can be a bit convoluted. In this uh, question number two C, what I'm asking you to do is, is reproduce, uh, excuse me, what I've written here uh, when we were having this discussion on Wednesday, the 24th. Uh, the answer for C should just be this uh, expression where I've taken my expectation value of V and now I've separated the integrals out and I can immediately evaluate the angular parts. And so for explicitly part C, I'm just looking for you to uh, do what I've done on this slide, be able to show that these integrals evaluate to four pi, and then basically plug in the explicit expressions of this psi function that were given in the homework. And that would be the end of part C. For part D, that's when you would actually do the, ang I'm sorry, the radial integrals and come up with a number. And if you haven't had a chance to, to do that actual integral yet, uh, the correct value for the expectation value of V is minus one atomic units. It's pretty neat, right? That the attraction between the electron and the proton uh, in the hydrogen atom has a potential energy of minus one. Uh, atomic units though, keep that in mind. And one atomic unit is really a huge amount of energy. <laughs> so with that, you should be able to carry out the rest of the calculation uh, connecting T and V with the Virial theorem uh, in order to confirm the total energy of the hydrogen atom is minus one half. So that's all I wanna say about homework nine. Uh, I think today then we're ready to uh, get into the material about, uh, or wrap up this material I should say about the hydrogen atom and then discuss uh, the variational principle. Oh, where is the last slide? All right, so we were discussing uh, the potential and a number of other things previously. And I just wanna quickly break down how these operators would work uh, on a formal quote unquote expression. So let me get this jam board up and we'll get going. All right, in the past, we've talked about writing these orbitals, uh, psi, n, L, M sub L, M sub S, bar. Remember that this is, uh, you know, the like most abstract level that I'm working on. Uh, this wave function has four quantum numbers, and we typically write that as a product of the spatial part, which has three quantum numbers, N, L, and M sub L, times the spin function. And remember that we have S in the first number and m sub s in the second. And for an electron, s is always equal to a half, right? It's a fermion, so it will have half integer spin. And in this case, it has one half as its spin. Uh, so anytime uh, I'm asking you for like a formal expression of an orbital, then this is the concept that I'm, I'm trying to dig at here. Uh, so I think on your homework 10, I'm, I'm mentioning this just to be clear about what's being asked. And so for this explicit expression here, uh, explicit expression, excuse me, I'm just looking for you to be able to write down an equation which looks like this with the correct quantum numbers filled in in the right places. Uh, you would not need to then plug in any definitions of the spatial wave function and make it more complicated. I'm just looking for you to be able to represent the wave function as a spatial wave function times the spin part and to be able to recognize which quantum numbers come from which part. So for homework 10 number one, uh, when I'm asking for that explicit expression here, uh, I'm not looking for something that depends on r, theta, and phi. I'm just looking for something that depends on the product of the spatial and spin wave functions. But along those lines, I do wanna make it clear that when we work with operators on these functions, then uh, we can certainly separate some things out. Uh, and so operators like the Hamiltonian, which don't depend on spin, when they act on a wave function that has all four quantum numbers, well, it turns out then we get to ignore the spin part and focus on the spatial part. 
So all we're doing here is saying that I'm going to plug in the definition. And when I distribute this Hamiltonian, it will only act on the spatial part. The Hamiltonian is spin independent. And so it doesn't act. Wow, independent. Wow, oh, struggle bus today. Sorry for that. I'm gonna just abbreviate. <laughs> So the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on spin, it just cares about the spatial quantum numbers. Uh, and so then we could write H hat acting on this thing, which you already know the answer of. What do I get back when the Hamiltonian acts on these three quantum numbers, right? The spatial part of the wave function, what do I get back? P sub n. That's correct, e sub n, right? I get back the eigenvalue. I've unfortunately run myself out of space. So I'm gonna jump over to the next slide and rewrite uh, the same expression. Uh, but what I'm trying to convince you of now is that we've got something we already know how to work with. Oh, sorry. And this just becomes e sub n. N, L, M sub L, M sub one half, M sub S. And hopefully you recognize now that I've regenerated my full four quantum number expression, the wave function here. So what we've just shown all in all is that when I have the Hamiltonian acting on the full hydrogenic wave function, right? It depends on all four quantum numbers then it just gives me back the quantum, I'm sorry, the eigenvalue, the energy of this system times the wave function. So the Hamiltonian acts on the spatial parts and gives me back the eigenvalue. Hopefully uh, you can imagine then that the spin operators would act only on the part that depends on spin. So, in other words, if I had something like s hat z acting on this, hopefully you'll trust that the logic works out in the same way. I would plug in the definition and expand it, separate the operator times the spin function and leave the spatial part alone. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to regenerate h bar m sub s times the original wave function. So by making our wave function a product of the spin part and the spatial part, we get to keep these really convenient eigenvalue relationships that we've talked about for each of those components separately, and then just apply them for the total wave function. So for again, homework 10, uh, these are the concepts that you will need uh, when you start to tackle some of these problems. If you work in Dirac notation, then you can use all of the tricks that we've talked about before for normalization, and the eigenvalue problems in order to do those things rapidly. I will check for questions here, but then I think we'd be ready to move on to the variational principle. All right, great. So the next unit we're gonna get into uh, is involving what happens when we can't solve something exactly. Uh, so, just to point out the resources that are available on the As You Learn page, I've unhidden the video lectures now. If you want to try to watch any of those, they can be very uh, informational here. I think uh, Trent does a good job breaking these concepts down. In particular, uh, the first two will be very important for the variational principle. Then there's some examples. And then we've got some stuff on perturbation theory, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, your homework is posted here as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, and there will be some other resources uh, that I put up a little later. I don't have any handwritten notes posted just yet uh, because I've got this Jamboard at the very top of the uh, class page, which I managed not to post. <laughs> Excuse me, one moment, let me do that. 
All right, we're recording again. Sorry for that hiccup, uh, but now we're ready to jump into our discussion about the variational principle. In this class so far, we've only talked about models which are exactly solvable. And that means that we can write down the differential equation, which describes the Schrodinger equation. And there's a mathematical procedure to get the exact set of eigenfunctions for those operators. When we move on and talk about real matter, things that have more than one or two electrons and multiple nuclei, it turns out the Schrodinger equation cannot be solved exactly. And so we have to approximate the solution. And so to do that, uh, you know, originally when people were thinking about ways to solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, there was a machinery in place to obtain something called the variational solution. And that ultimately led to the variational principle. And the idea behind this is to make a guess for the wave function of a system and then try to make it the best guess possible. So ultimately there's a very important uh, conceptual piece of information and that, that is your approximate solution. The function you're guessing has to obey the same boundary conditions as the exact solution. And if that is true, then you can apply the machinery we've talked about to calculate things like expectation values or normalization constants uh, in order to calculate the expectation value of, in particular, the Hamiltonian. And in general, for what we are discussing, this formulation is specifically for the ground state, the lowest energy state for a given Hamiltonian. If we want to look for excited states, there are variational principles, but they're much more complicated and certainly beyond the level where we're at right now. Um, but if you continue on in your uh, PCAM education, I'm sure you would hear about that eventually. So again, to be clear, when we guess a solution for the variational principle, it has to match the boundary conditions. And in this class, we're gonna be focused on the ground state, the lowest energy state. Again, this technique is really important because uh, we can't get the exact solution for real matter. Uh, and so we're trying to get the best solution we can by applying some sort of optimization, a minimization in particular. And if you remember back from calculus, this ties into what's called Newton's method. Um, no worries if you don't, but just to give you some reference point if you do. So the algorithm that we're really going to explore next week can be summarized in about four or five steps, depending on how we break it down. And so this procedure is very general. I wanna make that extremely clear, folks. This process applies to any quantum mechanical problem. We are gonna apply it to a specific example, the hydrogen atom, because we've already seen what the exact solution looks like. And that way we'd be able to compare and contrast the performance of the variational principle, right? The performance of our algorithm to guess a function and then go through the machinery to, to get the ground state energy. So in the end uh, for your homework next week, when we actually work through the machinery explicitly, uh, we'll be up trying to obtain an approximate solution <clears throat> which follows the same boundary conditions as the exact one. Remember that in real matter, r is the radial coordinate. And as r goes to infinity, the wave function has to decay to zero. This function is a Gaussian function, and it does have that behavior. It has this general shape of a bell curve, but as r increases to infinity, it goes to zero. So this function obeys the boundary conditions for the hydrogen atom, and we're going to use it to try to obtain an approximate solution. In this scheme, we're introducing what are called free parameters that we can use to obtain better solutions and in principle, the best solution possible. In the lab course, uh, we've talked about fitting curves both in PCHEM 1 and in PCHEM 2. Uh, and that idea basically is the same thing. You have some free parameters that you fit <laughs> to a functional form. The variational principle is basically the algorithm in quantum mechanics to obtain analytic expressions for things like the normalization constant or the energy. 
So how this process works is again to start by guessing a function that contains a one or a few free parameters and then trying to find the minimum of some energy function uh, as a function of those parameters. So after guessing the function, the first thing we always do is normalize. And so in order to do this, we're going to take our guess and plug it into the normalization expression. That means I'm gonna to have to integrate over all space. And ultimately I'll have to solve for the normalization constant n sub beta, but it's important to recognize that that normalization constant is a function of this parameter. So in this way, we can change the value of beta and that changes the behavior of our function. Any questions so far? So, never mind. We still got a few steps left. All that I would say is most important to take away right now is that we have introduced a guess for the wave function and it has a parameter that we can vary in order to get the best solution possible. So to continue with the algorithm, we need to calculate the energy. Remember that the energy, the ground state energy, is that quantity that I'm trying to minimize. So I need to calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. In this way, you're seeing me throw a little beta on the bottom of everything as a way to help you remember that it should be a function of beta, right? That beta is a parameter and that I'm able to change the value of beta in order to change the value of the energy. So ultimately, if we can calculate this kinetic energy, and you can, remember that we know what this function is. We know what this operator is. So we can definitely do this expectation value. And the same will be true down here for the expectation value of V. Once I combine them together, then I end up with the energy as a function of beta. That energy is the thing we want to minimize. And so in order to do that, we want to think about this mathematical problem, right? The minimization over all beta for this energy, E sub beta. And the process to do that is to take a derivative and then solve for where uh, that equals zero. Remember, this is like that extremum condition. In this case, we're trying to minimize. So we'll be looking for the beta that achieves the minimum value of some energy. So look at this cartoon with me. On the x-axis, I'm plotting beta, right? My independent variable is this free parameter beta. And the y-axis is E beta. What you're seeing is a cartoon. This is not an exact plot of anything, but the idea that's represented in this plot is exactly what the variation, excuse me, the variational principle is for. We try to find the beta value, which gives me the lowest possible energy for my system. Now there's a very important, uh, bound, I should say, some kind of mathematical bound for this process. And it turns out that the answer we get from the variational principle cannot be lower than the exact ground state energy. So the solid line here in this plot underneath the parabola, that would be the exact ground state energy for hydrogen, for example. Remember that this is just a cartoon though. This is not an exact plot. If this is the exact energy, then the variational principle can never get below that, and you even see it in this cartoon. The lowest value that I can get for any beta is the minimum here, and that minimum is still higher in energy than the exact ground state value. Once you know the value of beta min, then you can plug it back into your equation uh, for the guess in order to complete your uh, cycle. So once you have minimized the energy with respect to beta, you have found the best possible wave function for your guess. 
That doesn't mean there's only one guess, folks. There's probably an entire family of guesses that you could make. And so ultimately, when quantum chemists try to tackle calculations for real atoms and molecules, we don't just use a single parameter in these functions. Sometimes we have many parameters that we would then try to optimize, but that's pretty advanced. So for the homework, we're just going to focus on the simplest case with one free parameter. That's pretty much all I want to say about the uh, strategy for the variational principle. We don't have enough time to get into the nitty gritty, and I want to save that for next week's uh, sessions anyway. So I'm going to stop recording, and then I'd be happy to answer questions.